I got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight wrenches in my top drawer. Thanks for tuning in to MJ100K's podcast. We got one of my friends here with us today. His name is Tom. Thank you for coming to the podcast, Tom. No problem, MJ. What's going on? <laughs> Nothing. So, yo, Tom, I wanted to bring you on here because you uh, are an engineer that I used to work with at Cummins, okay. and I know you used to work in the turbo department. So I've been seeing that I do used car recommendation videos, and I noticed that I always recommend the engine that doesn't have a turbo. So I'm thinking that maybe I have some turbo phobia and I need you to help me with my rampant turbo phobia today here. <laughs> Your turbo phobia. All right, I'll do I what I can. More, I need to have more diversity. <laughs> so we're going to get into it. So, Tom, when you worked in the turbo department, like what was your job there? Like what, what did you do? So I still do. I still work for Cummins Turbo Technologies. Um, I started in turbos in the service department. So I was a service engineer. And basically, I tore down failed turbochargers. So that's I've torn down thousands of failed turbos. Um, and from there, I went to product engineering for the Charleston turbo plant. So that's where I am now. I'm in I'm in Charleston. Um, we make all the turbochargers. Uh, well, not all of them. We make mo most of them here for the uh, North American market. And then we have a plant over in uh, Huddersfield as well. Um, I was a product engineer for a few years, and now I'm in service. Or no, I'm in um, quality, uh, supplier quality engineering. Um, my current role, I I don't do much engineering at all. I'm in a kind of a leadership role in within um, quality, but I am responsible for the quality of um, the electronic actuators that we put on our turbochargers, our variable geometry turbochargers. Okay, cool. So, would you say that most of your turbos are uh... Oil cooled or cooled by coolant? Oil. Oil. Yeah. Oh. Our oil cooled. Yeah. We have our we have our electronic actuators have coolant that flow through them. We might have some turbochargers that are that are coolant, but majority of them is just oil cooled. So when you were working in the warranty department, can you tell us about some of the ways that the turbos would fail? Like, what were some of the common ways they would fail? Um, the biggest way would be. Foreign object damage, we call it FOD. That's 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 what kills most turbochargers, right? It's a big filter. It's after after the engine. So anything that happens in the engine goes downstream and hits the hits the turbine and, and destroys it. Um, ours are variable geometry, so there's more moving parts within within our turbocharger. So um, it's really sensitive to uh, debris and any kind of foreign objects. Um, next to that, you probably had some t oil contamination or Oil starvation, something with the oil. So you could have, you know, coolant in the oil. You could have debris in the oil. You could have the turbo not getting oil for some reason. Um, and then beyond that, maybe it was like lack of turbocharger care. So you get hot shutdown issues, things like that. Um, but those were probably the top three. We'd had some outliers and things like that. Um, most of the time it was not due to the turbocharger. Very rarely do we have turbocharger issues. If we did, those would be something like low cycle fatigue or high cycle fatigue on the turbine wheels. Um, but yeah, most of the time it was, it was, I guess you'd call it, uh, what do we call it? Uh, consequential damage. So for hot, for, so tell me about this. So for the turbos that you work with, you're not supposed to shut them down when they're hot. Um, any, any turbocharger that is, you know, you're not supposed to do a hot shutdown. Um, that's why I'm sure you know MJ, your automotive guy. You know they sell like turbocharger timers and things like that. Guys that have race cars, they'd have turbo timers that the engine would run for a while um, if it was too hot to cool the oil down and let the turbocharger cool. Um, but yeah, if, any turbocharger that's you know, especially with journal bearings, if you run up like drive a semi truck up a hill or something like that, get the engine really hot and you shut the engine off and you have no timer or no you know, no, no way to cool it down and just let the engine heat soak. Uh, you could damage the turbocharger doing that. Okay. Now I know that at Cummins, most of the engines are, are diesel, right? Pretty much all of them are diesel or natural gas. Yeah. Um, so 
So I was looking up the turbo for the Honda 1.5 liter engine, and that one is coolant uh, cooled. Mm -hmm. And so do you, so just knowing what you know about diesel turbos, would you recommend not doing hot shutdowns on a coolant cooled turbo as well on a gasoline engine or have you thought of that? I haven't thought of it. I mean, it, with modern engines, I, I have to think that the engineers at Honda have thought about this, right? They probably they probably understand turbocharger failure modes, and they understand that shutting the turbo down with hot oil in it is not good. So, I mean, you could design the geometry of the bearing housing to mitigate this. You can, like I said, cool it with engine coolant so the turbocharger never sees really high temperatures. So maybe hot shutdowns aren't a problem. Maybe the location of the turbocharger on the engine is not, um, you know, really susceptible to hot shutdown because yeah, depending on where the turbocharger is located it might heat soak more from neighboring components or you know neighboring engine parts things like that um but yeah i mean i have i drive a, a ford f-150 i have a twin turbo in mine and right. i don't know much about what in much about what maybe edit this <laughs> i don't know what uh engineering went into my engine I uh, guess I don't know anybody at Ford and I haven't really looked into it, but I'm very careful even with my engine. It's a modern engine, but if I, if it's really hot and I was just driving or towing my camper or something like that, um, mm -hmm. I'll let the engine idle for a few minutes before I shut it down. Just okay. because I know that that's not good for the turbocharger. All right, cool. Yeah. I was looking online and some people were saying, Oh, it's not a big deal, but I'm thinking maybe just as a precaution, if you have an engine, like it's not new, it's maybe between 100,000 and 200,000 miles, that, that might be a good extra precaution. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it can't hurt unless unless you know for certain that they did something to, to mitigate that in the engineering. Um, yeah, I mean, it doesn't hurt anything. <clears throat> All right. So you're saying foreign object damage. Uh, what kind of foreign objects would you see in those turbos? Um, a lot of times it would be, it could, I mean, it could be anything, anything upstream of the engine. So you could have bits of valve that broke off. You, and occasionally you could even have big chunks of carbon that get in there. Really? Um, yeah. We would see, I mean, crazy things like, you know, tools and nuts and bolts that were left in the engine, um, during service <laughs> events, things like that. We saw a rag get sucked into one. Oh man. <laughs> um, but I mean, yeah, I mean, anything that you can imagine in, in the engine upstream, if it breaks and it doesn't get caught somewhere else, it can make its way into the turbocharger. Um, uh -oh. so it could be easy to identify if you had like a catastrophic engine failure and you lost, you know, piston rings and you ground stuff up and you ran the engine afterward, the turbocharger is going to go too, because all that stuff's going to make its way downstream and hit the turbo. Uh -oh. um, in some cases you would have no engine issues and just for an object damage. Um, and that could be harder to identify. Um, we have a lot of resources available at Cummins, so we can do like SEM analysis and other kinds of analysis to determine what the chemical makeup of the FOD was in some cases. So even if we could identify it, we could say, oh, it was aluminum or it was steel, um, just based on what was what remnants was left on the turbine wheel. But it could be what anything. Is, what is SEM analysis? Um, scanning electron microscope. Okay. So you can get look at it the, in the parts of the turbo down at a microscopic level and try to figure out what happened. Yeah, yeah. You would you would look at the turbine wheel, which is made of ink and nail, so you'd know the base material, and then you could use SEM or any kind of uh, analysis where you can identify the chemical makeup on the turbine wheel and anything that's not ink and nail or um, the makeup of ink and nail. You know, is so ink and nail was that that's a special type of metal? Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. Sweet. So can you, can you remember back? Um, what is one of the worst failures that you saw for turbos? Like, is there any that stand out? I mean, once a turbo goes, they all pretty much look the same. Once you lose uh, a turbine wheel um, fin, um, an inducer blade or an exducer blade, something like that. Once that goes and you get an out of balance condition, you know, these turbochargers spit up to a hundred thousand, you know, RPM. So it's, once it goes, it goes. And if you don't stop the engine right away, um, you could just chew it up. And I mean, we've seen we've seen it so bad where the turbine wheel has ground itself down inside the turbine housing and gone into the after treatment. Um, 
you know, obviously the turbine wheel breaks off the uh, the turbo shaft and in that case. But yeah, once once you lose it, it, it just everything in there grounds up. The, the nozzle ring is gone. The turbine wheel is gone. The shaft and the bearings are melted. Um, so, you know, it the worst cases would be when, you know, you have. Yeah, I would say that's, that's probably the worst case. But in a lot of the, a lot of that time, a lot of those times, you can't figure out what actually happened because all the evidence of the failure is gone. Okay. All right, cool. So, so like I say, now, when I recommend cars, I try to recommend like some type of maintenance, like to go a little bit over what the factory maintenance is, because is my opinion that as the cars age, that you should probably do a little bit more than the factory maintenance, because at least for cars anyway, when they test them, they generally test them to around 100,000 miles. And when a lot of people are buying used cars, they're buying them with 130, 140, 180, 200,000 or more. So I'm thinking that the maintenance schedule should be, um, you need to go a little bit above and beyond because they don't mm -hmm. count for the wear when they're doing their tests. Yeah. So this is, this is my plan, right? Let me know what you think of this. So I got a car with a turbo. Instead of doing, like, let's say if they say 10,000 mile oil change, I'm going to drop it down to do the oil change maybe every three to 4,000 miles. Get the full synthetic oil with the factory filter. You know, the right weight, of course. Also to, uh, to change your coolant with the factory coolant um, a little more often. Like if it's supposed to be 50, maybe I'll change it at 35 or 40. Uh, change the air filter when you're supposed to change it with the factory filter. Um, as you were talking about, do the, uh, the, don't do the hot shut, warm shutdown. And I'm thinking with that, you should be able to maximize the life of your turbo. Uh, is there anything that you would add to that? I would not. Um. Yeah, I think you nailed it. Which, if you're specifically talking about the turbocharger, the maintenance that that's important is you got to have clean oil, not just for cooling, but um, depending on the turbo, if you have journal bearings like a lot of the Cummins turbochargers do, they're very susceptible to dirty oil. So clean oil, I in my, my vehicle, I use full synthetic. I use good filters, and I change every 5,000, which is way more than they recommend. Sweet. And, um and then, like you said, the air filter, because um, dirty air going into the, the turbocharger is no good either. So um, that's it. Oil and air needs to be clean. Everything going into that turbo. And then heat. And, um, one other question about turbos. Um, I saw this. It was a YouTuber that uh, he was a mechanic working at Ford. And he said there were some inline screens on the lines that go to the turbo hmm. that act as a filter. Um, and he was saying... When he changes, when he has to replace somebody's turbo, he tells them, "Are oh, you should replace these filters too." And sometimes they don't want to do it. <clears throat> so, have you seen filters like that? And if so, well, what are your thoughts on replacing them? I haven't seen those, but that would be on the engine side of things, which we do make. Cummins makes engines as well, obviously, um, but I'm not familiar with with that side. That'd be the the engine side. So, um, obviously, if there are screens there and they're meant to trap debris, then they they should be a maintenance item. Yeah. <laughs> you should yeah, be changing obviously. them. <laughs> all right. Yeah. All right. So, all right. I think I'm starting to feel good about turbos now. I'm <laughs> Turbophobia is going Less turbophobic. <laughs> I'm turbophobic too, man. Like I said, I, with my truck, I bought it used, and I bought it with 40,000 miles, and that was my biggest concern was, was the last – did the last guy take good care of this vehicle? Because with a naturally aspirated engine – you know, with 40,000 miles, there's not too much the guy can do to, to ruin it, right? He could not change the oil for 40,000. Yeah. That's a, that's about it. But with, with the turbocharger, you really want to make sure that they took took really good care of it. And um, so I was nervous buying my truck with 45,000 miles, not knowing the history. So, yo, Tom, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. I made a video about how to try to check the history of the mm -hmm. car before or truck before you buy it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and I've I've been telling people this for a while. Thank you for, for agreeing with me on that. <laughs> How do you? So, what's something you could do to to check on the the health of the turbocharger? What are some things you can look for that would like some indicators? Um, 
I know there are there are codes the OBD2 codes that um that'll come up if there are problems with the turbo. Mm. Um, I know if you could drive it and just feel if it feels really um like sluggish for that type of engine. Um, I always wondered, you know that you know in your in your I don't know, you know how people reset their their service reminders in their vehicle? Mm-hmm. Like I don't use that thing, right? I just change every five thousand, so I don't really reset it. But is there like is there something you can go into the OBD and check how many times that's been reset? Um, not that not for OBD two. There may be some stuff for specific manufacturers that you would need the um, the dealership scan tool. They may have that on different models. I'm not sure, but the way to I recommend just anybody could check them at their own house like right now is what i do is um i do go to this website called cargurus.com and so you'll see an ad for a car that you like and then usually that ad will be tied to a dealership so a dealership put that ad up usually the dealership will have a link to their website on the car gurus website so i go to the dealership's website and then usually on the dealership's website they'll have the car fact report for that vehicle and you click on that and it's usually free once you're on the dealership's website and then um a lot of them will have the maintenance records there mm. just right there so you'll see it'll be like it'll have all the records to say registration new title and then it'll be like maintenance if, if they get it done at a dealership or yeah a participating um place and it'll tell you oil change five thousand when it'll tell you the mileage the date everything Oh, wow. I didn't know that. Yeah. I had actually, I, I guess I did know that, but I didn't do that for this vehicle. I don't know why I didn't. But, yeah. Yeah. I don't know. yeah just, and, you know, it, it ain't always going to be perfect because, you know, somebody could change the oil at their house, but usually, usually it's on there. So you can narrow down your choices to the ones with the best maintenance record. Like that's mm -hmm. what I did for my Camry, that my new Camry I just bought, the uh, 2017. I kept doing that and I finally found one. It was like it had all the maintenance on there. It was like 5,000, 10,000, like every oil change, coolant flush, everything was on there. So I was like, I'm getting this one. Nice. Yeah, that's <laughs> yeah. nice. With um, with airplanes, that's uh, a thing that you actually legally have to have logbooks for the engine, logbooks for the airframe. A lot of guys have them for the avionics too. So when you go to purchase an aircraft, you have like logbooks you can go back from like mine go back to 1965 all Whoa. every single oil change the first flight dude it's like it's all in there every yeah. single time you do anything you log it and that's a legal thing that's um, perfect yeah but they don't have that for cars <laughs> they should i know the cars are, nice. airplanes are always like a step a level above cars as far as uh yeah. trying to be perfect with with all the maintenance and everything which yeah. is important because you know yeah can't yeah you don't want to can't pull over <laughs> yeah so uh so we'll talk about your website real quick then i'll let you get it out of here or your channel real quick so tom has a youtube channel where he uh he flies around in his airplane and paramotors so uh you want to tell us a little bit about that tom yeah you nailed it i just that's it i fly around in an airplane and in my paramotor so it's all aviation content um flying around learning how to fly going through uh, my private pilot, my instrument rating, my commercial pilot's license, and I'm just going to keep going. So if you're into that kind of stuff, check it out. So you're trying to get a commercial pilot's license, right? What day is today? It's Sunday. So if I don't fail and the weather is good, by Thursday, I'll be a commercial pilot. That's my, oh, sweet, my check man. rides on Thursday. So <laughs> um, That's awesome. I had, yeah. I had to push it back a month already because of weather, but hopefully this Thursday is good weather and I can get it done. All right, sweet. Well, good luck, man. Uh, what's the name of your channel? Just my name, Tom Kubat, K-U-B-A-T. All right, sweet. All right, well, thanks for coming by to the, <laughs> the podcast. We got a lot of information from you. I'm feeling better about turbos now. All right. And uh, thanks for coming by, man. No problem. Good talking to you, buddy. All right, see you later. All right, peace.